Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Jonelle Matthews? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing him in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. It's fairly brief. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Jonel Matthews was born in Santa Barbara, California, on February 9, 1972. Her mother was only 13 years old at the time. Jim and Gloria Matthews adopted Jonel in March of 1972. The couple also had another daughter named Jennifer. The Matthews family moved to Greeley, Colorado in 1978. Jim worked as an elementary school principal, and Gloria worked in a restaurant. Now moving to the timeline of the crime, we go to December 20, 1984. 12-year-old Jonelle was a member of a middle school choir and was performing in a holiday concert that evening. Jonelle's father, Jim, was with Jennifer. She was playing in a basketball game. Gloria was attending to Jonelle's grandfather, who lived in another state and was sick. Jonelle had a friend named Deanne Ross. Deanne and her father, Russell Ross, drove Jonelle home, dropping her off at 8.15 p.m. No one else was in Jonelle's house at that time. Russell made sure that Jonelle entered the house and turned on a light before driving away. Just after 8.30 p.m., the phone rang in the house. It was somebody calling for Jim. Jonelle spoke to the caller briefly and took a message. She would never be heard from again. Jim arrived home at 9.30 p.m. He noticed the garage door was open and nobody was in the house. Janelle's shoes and scarf were in the family room near a heater. She would frequently sit in that area. Jennifer arrived home at 10 p.m. There was still no sign of Janelle. Jim called a few friends, trying to figure out if anybody had seen Janelle, but no one had. He called the police at 10.15 p.m. The police arrived and started investigating. They found shoe prints in the snow outside the house, which had been disturbed using a rake from the garage, almost like the perpetrator was trying to destroy the evidence that they were there. There was no sign of forced entry or of any type of altercation. The police initially thought that Jonelle's birth mother could have taken her. They placed her under surveillance without telling her anything about the disappearance, but there was no indication that she was involved. About 13 years later, in 1997, Jonelle's birth mother sent a letter to Gloria asking to visit Jonelle. This is when she would find out Jonelle was missing. Initially, the police also suspected Jim Matthews. According to Jim, the police gave him a so-called lie detector test, which they claimed that he failed. A person cannot pass or fail a polygraph. They are pseudoscientific nonsense. But this is a tactic that the police use. They tell someone that they failed in order to pressure them to confess. Jim did not fall for this trick. He knew that he was not involved. Eventually, he was cleared as a suspect. The police continued to investigate, but they did not have any success. Two years after the disappearance, Jim and Gloria moved to the Philippines. Years later, they retired in Costa Rica. Jennifer left Colorado after getting married. In 1994, Jonelle Matthews was declared legally dead. About 25 years later, on July 23, 2019, a construction crew was installing a pipeline at a site about 15 miles southeast of Jonelle's house in Greeley, Colorado. They found human remains, which were later identified as belonging to Jonelle. She had been shot one time in the head. The discovery of Jonelle's remains did not provide any new information helpful to the investigation other than confirming she was dead. Investigators were unable to recover any usable DNA from her remains or clothing. The case appeared to remain at a standstill. In September of 2019, the Greeley Police Department identified a person of interest, a man named Stephen Pankey. In 1984, Stephen had lived in Greeley, Colorado, with his now ex-wife, Angela Hicks, and his son, Mark. His residence was only two miles from the Matthews family residence. He also attended the same church as the Matthews family. 
The police did not initially question Stephen Pankey in connection with Joe Nell's disappearance. Stephen was only a suspect because he inserted himself into the investigation, making a number of inculpatory statements and demonstrating bizarre behavior. In October of 2020, 69-year-old Stephen Pankey was charged in connection with Joe Nell's death. He was facing first-degree murder, felony murder, second-degree kidnapping, and false reporting to authorities. His trial started in October of 2021. In November, he was found guilty of false reporting to authorities, which is a misdemeanor, but a mistrial was declared for the other charges. The state of Colorado intends to try him again. Now moving to my analysis. Stephen Pankey has been described as talkative, strange, bizarre, and someone who lies frequently. Stephen's defense attorney suggested that Stephen suffered from obsessive compulsive behavior and perhaps was mentally ill. The state claims that Stephen does not have a mental disorder. Stephen has a long history of encounters with law enforcement and general conflict with people. He had been charged with harassment and trespassing in connection with his behavior at a bank. Apparently, he did this more than once. He really had trouble with banks. In 1977, he was charged with committing an assault of a sexual nature against a woman at the church where he attended. This is the same church where the Matthews family attended. Stephen said that he was a youth pastor at the church and he had consensual sex with the woman. Jim said that Stephen was actually the janitor at the church. The woman eventually asked for the case to be dismissed, and it was. About five years after Jonelle's disappearance, Stephen moved to Shoshone, Idaho. His wife filed for divorce in 2001. In 2004 and 2008, he ran for sheriff and lost. He ran for lieutenant governor in 2010 and for governor in 2014 and 2018. He lost each time badly. One time he ran as a Constitution Party candidate. He said members of the party tried to perform an exorcism on him during the convention. Perhaps it was just an effort to double the voting power, like the person and the demon could each vote. Most parties neglect pursuing the demon vote. The party denies that it performed an exorcism on Stephen or anybody at the convention. It was an exorcism-free convention. In 2020, Stephen once again ran for sheriff in an effort to be associated with law enforcement. He was unsuccessful at becoming sheriff, but he was able to spend some time with officers after being arrested a short time later. Now moving to the question, is Stephen Pankey guilty of murdering Janelle Matthews, as the state of Colorado asserted? Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that Stephen is guilty, starting with the inculpatory evidence. On December 21, 1984, the day after Jonelle went missing, Stephen packed up his family and went to Big Bear Lake, California. His ex-wife claimed this trip was a surprise. Stephen said it had been planned for weeks or months. When returning from California, Stephen's wife said that he asked to listen to the radio in the car, which was highly unusual behavior for him. He had banned the family from ever listening to the radio or watching TV. Stephen was particularly interested in stories about Jonelle Matthews. He flipped through the channels trying to find one that was discussing that case. Also, according to his wife, after arriving back in Greeley, he drove directly to the grocery store and told his wife to buy newspapers containing stories about Jonelle Matthews. He made his wife read the stories to him out loud. Stephen's wife said after they moved away from Colorado, Stephen would talk about the case from time to time. Stephen told the police about the shoe prints in the snow around Jonelle's house and how they had been disturbed with a rake. The police never released this information to the public. Stephen told the media that he was a person of interest in the case. He also claimed a police officer, who later became the mayor of Greeley, was a person of interest, which was not true. In 1989, after Stephen was in Idaho, he called a former neighbor of his in Colorado and asked if the Jonelle Matthews case had been solved. In one of Stephen's criminal cases involving harassment at a bank, he claimed that his behavior stemmed from being pressured to be an informant in the Jonelle Matthews case. Stephen said that he was worried he would get the death penalty if he revealed the location of her body. Stephen had a criminal history, 
One of his arrests occurred the day before Joe Nell disappeared. He was being unruly at a bank. In addition to the inculpatory items I mentioned, one could argue that Stephen's bizarre behavior doesn't look good either, even though, strictly speaking, it's not inculpatory. For example, just weeks after the crime, he claimed that he contacted investigators and told them that his father-in-law, who worked at a graveyard, was approached by a police officer about burying a body. Now moving to the exculpatory evidence. No physical evidence whatsoever connects Stephen Pankey to the murder. No DNA, no blood, nothing. There are no witnesses. There's no video of him committing the crime. Stephen testified that all his prior inculpatory statements were lies. He was bitter and just making stuff up. He didn't know anything about the case. His ex-wife was a key witness against him. One could easily argue that her testimony could be biased. Stephen's defense attorney said that Angela Hicks developed her memories all of a sudden. She never suspected Stephen had anything to do with the case until 1999. There was a potential alternate suspect, a man named Norris Drake, whose mother's house was right across the street from Jonell's residence. Norris allegedly had an interest in young girls and knew Jonell. As far as the never-released information about the shoe prints and the rake, Stephen could have found out from any number of people, including a friend of Jonell's father who was with him at the basketball game on the night of Jonell's disappearance. The friend testified that he had knowledge about the case, which had not been shared with the public. When considering all the evidence, do I think that Stephen Pankey was guilty? I think he was certainly guilty of lying to the authorities. The jury felt the same way. As far as the murder and kidnapping, I don't think that he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I'm not even sure he was guilty in reality. Even if Stephen Pankey had confessed to the murder, there is not enough evidence to convict him in this case. He's clearly not a sophisticated criminal, yet the state would have people believe Stephen committed this murder and left behind no evidence which could be connected to him. Here's my theory about what happened. This is just my opinion. Stephen Pankey struggled with various mental health symptoms. He likes to feel important. He wanted people to pay attention to him. Stephen viewed the Jonelle Matthews case as a way to attract attention. It had captivated the attention in Greeley, Colorado, and he was trying to connect to that. He pretended that he had something to do with the case. He made a series of rambling and nonsensical statements about the case. His curiosity led him to collect information about the disappearance including the shoe prints. The knowledge of the shoe prints combined with his bizarre statements led to his arrest. Mental health symptoms can manifest in a variety of ways. There have been other cases where innocent people have implicated themselves, sometimes by confessing, but other times by pretending to be involved in the case somehow. This practice is always considered risky, as exemplified in the Stephen Pankey case. He probably never thought that he would be arrested for Jonell's murder, but he was playing with fire. The police take murder pretty seriously, and in the absence of any leads, the standards they apply for naming a suspect can become unbelievably low. Those are my thoughts in the case of Jonell Matthews. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be as intriguing as voting demons. Thanks for watching.